Here we go. Welcome to another edition of Storytime. Um, this uh, story for today comes from Cradle of Violence, How Boston's Waterfront Mobs Ignited the American Revolution uh, by author Russell Bourne. So I finished this book this fall before I went to Boston, and I was really happy I read it for a few things. It, it really helped me realize just how much the revolution was a result of all the people of, of all the working class and laborers, uh, especially of Boston, and also because it told some crazy stories. And, and you'll hear more than just the ones from today. So we're going to start off with um, chapter one, the maritime origins of a mutinous town. Remember uh, Boston being a city on the water uh, with many ports. So it begins, the ambitious and well-connected British Foreign Service official Francis Bernard, who you see here, who had served competently as the governor of New Jersey during the French and Indian Wars, which we just learned about, believed that to assume the governorship of prosperous Massachusetts would be to attain the pinnacle of his career. It was a post that he considered much deserved and quite in keeping with his talents. The appointment was arranged in 1760, that apparently wonderful year in which Montreal was captured and the French were totally defeated in North America. Little did Bernard know that the War of American Independence was only 15 years in the future and that the elegant colonial capital to which he so expectantly moved with his wife and 10 children, Boston, would be the locus of mob violence whose sparks would leave him scarred forever and would help to ignite the American Revolution. It all happened with amazing speed Within less than five years of his arrival, Bernard was writing home that in order to defeat the hated Stamp Act, Bostonians were combining in a body to raise a rebellion. Not only did he see the aroused citizens of America's leading seaport as violent and savage and determined to destroy royal authority, but also he accused them of general leveling, that is, desiring to take away the distinction of rich and poor. In an effort to alert the most powerful officials in the king's administration and to make himself appear the victim of more than a passing storm, he wrote ominously that the real authority of government is at an end. Civilization itself was threatened. Painting a picture of anarchy let loose, a picture that might be compared with Dickinson's later view of the French Revolution seen here, Bernard went on to report that some of the principal ringleaders of the late riots walk the streets with impunity. No officer dares attack them. No witnesses appear against them, and no judge acts upon this. Indeed, Bernard's lieutenant governor, Massachusetts-born Thomas Hutchinson, seen here who I always thought looked a bit like Pete Davidson, chose this moment in 1765 to resign timorously his secondary position as chief judge of the province. Hutchinson's mansion in the north end of Boston, a structure of Inigo Jones-style beauty, was, was one of the peninsular town's few architectural gems, was viciously ripped apart as a Stamp Act riot burst all expandable bounds. The mob sweated for a full three hours before toppling the building's lofty cupola, after which they turned their frenzied, drunken attention to stripping and wrecking the interior, including the wine cellar. Hutchinson, in the years of unceasing riots that followed, seemed to join Bernard in abandoning all hope of ever restoring orderly, not to mention royal government to the province. He had always loved Massachusetts Bay, but he had never comprehended the salty ways of its capital's people. Violence in consciousness on the waterfront. Who could understand the contradictory citizens of Boston with an access of steeples and its Puritan ethos now turning to violence. Who then or in subsequent generations had an adequate explanation or rationale for those inbred, anti-authoritarian people whose stamp act riots exploded into the most damaging of all such protests staged throughout the American colonies? One purpose of this book is to provide an interpretation of their mutinous spirit, its roots and its consequences. And this chapter, with its brief introduction of Bernard and Hutchinson, and others who will be portrayed more fully in later chapters, set the scene for their extraordinary personalities and rebellious actions. The total of Boston's riots, which began near the end of the near preceding century and lasted well into the 1700s, exceeded 30, far surpassing comparable disturbances in all other colonial ports. 
Yet, however, earth-shaking their results, they continue to appear as the quixotic actions of a very idiosyncratic, curiously stressed people. That was the conclusion of Nathaniel Hawthorne, seen here, the deeply probing, deeply ironic writer who demonstrated his understanding of, as opposed to sympathy for, stressed New England characters in The Scarlet Letter and The House of the Seven Gables. Hawthorne wrote a remarkable short story in 1837 called My Kinsman, Major Molyneux, that reveals his fascination with Boston's pre-revolutionary mobs. This grotesque and cruel sketch of Bostonians in a tarring and feathering incident is drawn from historical sketch, or from historical research, as well as presumably from the author's tribal memory. Here is the most vivid part of the story. A mighty stream of people now emptied into the street and came rolling slowly towards the church. A single horseman wheeled the corner in the midst of them, and close behind him came a band of fearful wind instruments, sending forth a fresher discord, now that no intervening buildings kept it from the ear. Then a redder light disturbed the moonbeams, and a dense multitude of torches shone along the street, concealing by their glare whatever object they illuminated. The single horseman, clad in a military dress and bearing a drawn sword, rode onward as the leader, and by his fierce and variegated countenance appeared like a war personified. The red of one cheek was an emblem of fire and sword. The blackness of the other betokened the mourning which attends them. In his train were wild figures in the Indian dress, and many fantastic shapes without a model, giving the whole march a visionary air, as if a dream had spoken forth from some feverish brain and was sweeping visibly through the midnight streets. A mass of people, inactive except as applauding spectators, hemmed the procession in, and several women ran along the sidewalks, piercing the confusion of heavier sounds with their shrill voices of mirth or terror. Another Yankee who thought he understood the troublesome pro people of Boston, and one who lived at the actual time of the pre-revolutionary events, was the rationalistic congressional clergyman Jonathan Mayhew, seen here, heir to a long line of appropriately eccentric Massachusetts Bay colonists. In the pews of his affluent West Church sat liberal-minded citizens such as James Otis, Samuel Adams, and Robert Treat Payne, the last of whom would later prosecute the British troops on trial for the Boston Massacre and would even later sign the Declaration of Independence. Paul Revere, in his younger years, had received a harsh parental whipping for attending Mayhew's church. The pastor had been judged by other Congregationalists as excessive in his view of human freedom. Although Mayhew was not one of the new light, hopefully you remember that from the Great Awakening uh, video, enthusiast in this era, was individualistic Christian renewal that came to be called the Great Awakening. He dared to preach the novel message that civil and religious liberty were both mandatory and inseparable. On the Sunday before the Stamp Act riots, it happened that Mayhew had delivered a particularly fiery sermon, blasting it on the text, I would, they were even cut off which trouble you, for brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Yet on hearing of the wreckage of Hutchinson's house, this is what it looked like before it was destroyed, and other associated acts of violence, the preacher was immediately seized by the puritanical guilt spasm, a reaction not unlike that of the town's well-to-do merchants, who, however much they had disliked Hutchinson in his high and mighty manners, feared that something even more consequential than property destruction had occurred. They saw that the people involved in the affair had been of the lowest sort, fishermen and dockers and seamen. In one voice, the merchants condemned this, condemned this licentious action of the lesser ones, the outrageous presumption on the part of riffraff and outcasts that they would muscle their way into what was truly a grave political matter. The merchant's words echoed those of their fathers back in 1747, when popular riots against the Royal Navy's impressment actions had impelled them to react conservatively against the rioters. They had heaped blame for what had truly been a community uprising on foreign seamen, servants, Negroes, and other persons of meal and vile condition. Orders or semblance thereof must be preserved whoever the disturbers might be. Such people might not mutiny against God's community. In the same spirit of denial, Jonathan Mayhew penned a personal letter of regret to his neighbor, Thomas Hutchinson, 
deploring the action of the mob and wondering whether his own understanding of Boston of all sorts and conditions might have been an error. He wrote that henceforth he needed, needed to moderate and pacify than to risk exciting so sensitive a people. By sensitive, did the preacher mean hysterical? Mayhew's view of his fellow citizens was restrictly that of a pastor in his high pulpit, looking down on the erratic sheep below. Much more attentive to God's wishes than to those of man or woman, he should perhaps be excused for not knowing much about persons of vile and mean condition. Bostonians who lived on the edge of starvation, in terror of impressment, and at the call of brutal masters. Yet a man of such aloof intelligence must have pondered, even as he castigated himself and consoled his neighbor, how people of that condition could have taken so fierce an interest in an international issue like the Stamp Act. As Hutchinson himself remarked to many of those in the mob, he called them the cudgel boys, never knew what a Stamp Act was. Were they not, by their rioting, really making a mockery of the exalted liberty that Mayhew advocated? Were they making Boston not a cradle of liberty, but a cradle of violence and licentiousness? An exploration of their town's history may help reveal their intentions. So what did they do? Did they help create chaos or did they help create liberty? We'll discuss.